Hi, everyone. Just a quick update uh, on COVID-19 and the situation here in the, our facilities at 1805 Washington Street. I was on a call with the governor and 750 or so other religious leaders today, and we heard that, that on June 1st, new regulations for um, uh, places of worship will be coming out. They'll be, they'll be in force on the 4th of, by the 4th of June. So we hope not too long after that to be back in our facilities. We don't know exactly when that's going to be. We do have a team of people who are working on that right now. We will get the word out to you through the Friday blast and through these videos and things. So pay attention to that. But just be praying for us as well um, as we continue to pray for you and seek God as we move forward into this new normal. Love you guys. I look forward to worshiping together with you in person. March 2020, the world changed deeply and profoundly. And for the first few days, or for some of us, the first few weeks, we, we did something remarkable, something that no one would have predicted. We pivoted. We looked at what happened and we realized that the world that we had been able to function in so well was now so different. And we had to begin to do some of the things we'd done before in a brand new way. We had, we had gotten used to life as it was, and now we had to get used to life in this, in this new normal. We had to learn how to do everything from ordering groceries online to, to caring for others in different ways to attending online worship services to, to getting on a Zoom call so that we could meet with our friends in our small groups to wearing a mask every time we went on in public. And underneath it all was a voice that kept asking the same nagging question. When is everything going to get back to normal? And the longer we've been safer at home, the clearer it's become that whatever normal was pre-COVID-19, we were moving into a space of a brand new normal post-COVID-19. But how do you prepare for something new, some new normal, when nearly every expert that you hear says that we're entering into a period of global unpredictability and global instability, and nobody really knows what lies ahead? Now, we're formulating our plan to come back into our facilities. On June 1st, the governor is going to be um, uh, issuing brand new regulations and, and guidelines for how places of worship are able to, to get back together in public services, to meet in person. Those are going to affect June 4th. So our, our plan is within not too long into the future, we'll be able to meet back in person well, one of the things we've discovered that opening our facilities is going to be much more difficult than closing our facilities ever was. Because everything that we thought was solid, immovable, unchanging, has changed. Jesus had been teaching from the back of a boat. He, he had his disciples push the boat out so that, so that more people would be able to, to hear him and he'd be able to have eye contact with them. It was a long day. Now, Jesus was an incredible story teacher, storyteller. Now, he would be able to tell a story that you would just wrap yourself up in. And before you realized it, he wasn't just telling a story. He was telling your story. And there you were exposed in front of everyone. And Jesus peering deep into your soul. And even though it felt uncomfortable, every person there was in the same boat. Now, one of the ways Jesus told stories most often was through parables. But the thing about parables was even those closest to him didn't really get them. They didn't understand them. They were confusing. Jesus was continually having to explain to his disciples what the parables were all about what the point of the story was. Well, in one particular day, Jesus teaching in the back of this boat and his disciples were hot. It was long. It was really great, but they were tired. And Jesus did something that he often did to his disciples. And he did something that he often does to us. 
He told them a story. But he didn't just say it in words. He put them in the middle of this story. This story that would reveal them to themselves in such a way that they would never forget. And it's a story that they continue to tell with their lives. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. When you get there to Mark chapter 4, we'll be going to verse 35, where we read these words. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Well, what it's saying is, Jesus had them turn the boat around while he was teaching the crowd. And the back of the boat was aimed toward the, the, the shoreline. So when he said, let's, let's go to the other side, they climbed in. He just turned around and he sat down on the cushion and they headed out. They took him with them just as he was. And other boats were with him and a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Many of the disciples were, were seasoned fishermen. And their faith, honestly, was in what they knew. They knew the sea. They knew boats. And they, unfortunately, knew storms. And storms like this arose on the sea in this area all the time. Their experience told them that storms like this were dangerous. They could swamp a boat. They could flip it over. They could rip it apart. They could, they could sink it. And they could drown even the most experienced sailor. They'd done everything they knew how. They had aimed the boat into the, into the waves. They had tacked back and forth. They had done everything they could with the sails. They had continued bailing the water out. And it was not helping. They were tired. They were scared. And I think they were probably a little bit frustrated. Maybe even a little bit angry. Because while they were doing all of this, Jesus was sleeping on a cushion. Now, they knew that he wasn't a fisherman. I mean, he was a craftsman. So he wouldn't have been able to really help. But, but they, they said, look, Jesus, we know you're not a sailor, but don't you even care that we're going to die? The interesting thing to me is that Jesus did not even respond to their question. He didn't even respond directly. He, didn't even, he never answered the question. Instead, it says, and he awoke and he rebuked the sea, the wind, and he said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He didn't speak to them. He spoke oddly to the wind itself. He spoke to the sea itself. He said to the sea and to the wind, literally, be muzzled and stay that way. It's the same word he used when a demon wanted to speak back in the first chapter of Mark. Jesus rebuked that demon saying, be silent and come out of him. Be silent and stay silent. Maybe Jesus noticed some demonic influence in this storm. The enemy was messing with him. But Jesus wasn't having any of it. Jesus was calm, so calm he was asleep. But the best way to attack somebody who you cannot really attack is to attack those they love. And so the enemy stirred up this storm to terrify the disciples. And Jesus rebuked that storm and he told it to be silent just like he had that demon. Jesus spoke to the wind and to the sea, and it calmed immediately. The message draws a really cool picture with these words. I like how it says it. It says, the wind ran out of breath, and the sea became smooth as glass. Can you imagine? One second, you're standing almost to your knees in water. You are soaking wet from head to toe. The, 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 the wind is blowing. The, the spray stings your eyes. The rocking and rolling of the sea. 
the constant annoyance of salt crunching between your teeth. The wind is so loud that you have to shout to be heard, but it listens to Jesus' voice and in obedience, it bows to his will. The convulsing sea, the howling wind, the terrified, fatigued shouts of the disciples, all calmed when Jesus spoke. He had multiplied a handful of fish and loaves and fed thousands. He had raised people from the dead. He had healed lepers. He had given sight to the blind. And yet the disciples thought this storm was too big for him to handle. The disciples wanted Jesus to calm the storm in the sea and wind. But he took aim at a different storm. Verse 40. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Don't you care about us, Jesus? Of course he cared about them. But more dangerous to them and to us than the storm or COVID-19 or whatever cataclysmic event we are facing is the unbelief that we harbor in the darkest recesses of our hearts and our minds. Jesus would say to you and to me, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I mean, think about it. We have the entire Bible, all the Old Testament, all the New Testament. We know all the stories. We've seen, we read about and studied all the miracles. Is there anything too big for God to handle? Is there any problem that could come into your life or mine that's too big for God to handle? We've heard the stories of people in our lifetimes who've seen God show up in powerful ways. We've told the stories. We've experienced God moving in our lives. Is there anything too big for God to handle? Our greatest problems will never attack us from outside. They will always strike us from inside and to calm the storm that rages in our hearts whatever the storm is that rages outside God calls on us to believe that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world because he knows that the source of our problem is not what's attacking us from outside. The source of our problem is the unbelief that assaults us from within. It's the unbelief that assaults us from within. When we are afraid, we are saying that we do not believe that Jesus can handle that storm. The fear they were battling was the ultimate fear. The fear we must all face. It was the fear of death. They said, Jesus, don't you care that we're about to die? They were experienced with storms. They knew that this storm could be the end of all of them. The boat could sink. The boat could be ripped apart. And they could be killed by drowning or the, the debris. The thing we need to understand is that Almost every fear that we could be af afraid of or captivated by has its foundation in the fear of death. Whether it's slow and painful or quick, death with its icy fingers wrapped around our throats, listen carefully, has no power and no authority when our faith is in Jesus. The storm revealed the disciples' unbelief in Jesus. And it was about to get even worse. Look at verse 41. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? See, they were afraid because of the storm. 
And Jesus took the storm away and they got even more afraid because when the storm outside is calmed, the fear remains. It reveals the true storm that rages constantly within us. When the storm outside is calmed and when the fear remains, it reveals something to us. It reveals that there's this true storm, a storm of unbelief that continues to rage. They thought that the storm on the sea was the problem. <laughs> but since Jesus revealed the true storm in their hearts and minds, they stood exposed before him. In 1984, Jerry Levin, the CNN bureau chief in Beirut, was kidnapped on his way to work. He was held hostage for more than a year by Shiite radicals. They, they chained him to a radiator with a chain so short that he wasn't able, even able to stand to his full length. Now, before this time, Jerry Levin was a confirmed agnostic. He, he actually had kind of thought about Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mountain, and he thought that, that his, his views on how people should live were too flimsy to, to actually work in the real world. But day after day, after his, as his captors used his fear of death to humiliate him, Jerry began to see that constantly escalating violence was no solution to the international disputes that they were talking about. The Sermon on the Mount was not wishful thinking as he had originally thought. It was actually the only reasonable response to an absurd world. And so, in an absolute hopeless situation, Jerry Levin experienced a moment of clarity. This is what he said. It was a shrinking millionth of a second. On one side, I did not believe. And on the other side, I did believe. And after he escaped, no longer afraid to die, because he finally put his trust in Jesus, Jerry and Sis, his wife, Levin, became activists for peace in Israel, in the occupied territories. Who then is this who speaks and the wind and the sea obey him? You know who he is? He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the God who can handle anything. No problem is too big. Nothing scares him. Nothing intimidates him. Nothing makes him run the other way. He is greater than everything. And because he lives in you as a follower of Christ and in me, and we know that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, there is no problem that we cannot tackle in his strength and following him in faith. Because he is in me and because he is in you, together we can face whatever storms this world throws at us. Whatever storm this world throws at us. I want to encourage you to let the words of Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 39 from the message version to wash over your soul, to encourage you, to build you up. Listen to what the scriptures say. And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you, God. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one, and none of this, Paul says, phases us because Jesus loves us. Do you believe that? Jesus loves you. A great theologian of yesteryear was asked one day, what is the most significant theological truth you have ever discovered? 
He looked into the camera and in the grainy film that I watched, he said this, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? Paul says, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, li- nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, embraced us. Nothing can get between us. Do you believe that? This passage does not say that we will be spared from hard things in life. It does say, though, that nothing will be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us, even though he brings hard things into our lives. The only barrier that we face as we walk together arm in arm into post-COVID-19 is un- and in the, the post-COVID-19 world is unbelief. Jesus has everything else covered. And this storm is God's grace to reveal to us the state of our faith, to reveal to us any areas of weakness in, our, in how much we believe Jesus and trust him. What has God been showing about you about your faith since March 2020? What storm of unbelief has been raging as you've encountered the storm that is COVID-19? How does God want you to pivot away from unbelief? You see, back in March 2020, you pivoted. You began to do things differently. You began to do new things because you realized that the normal you lived in before was gone and you have a new normal. And God has been using that storm to point out to you that there's some things that have been going on inside of you that I want to change. I want to make new. What is God saying to you through this time? One of the most important truths we need to grab a hold of and never forget is that God never wastes a hurt. God never wastes a difficult time. Let's not do that either. Let's not go through this and expect that we're going to come out the same. Because if we do, we haven't been listening. What steps of faith is God calling you to take right now? Here's some steps of faith you might consider. First, maybe you've believed that Jesus is your Savior, but do you believe that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, like Romans 8 says? This is not some nice theological truth that's supposed to help you sleep well at night. It is the truth of the Scriptures. Do you believe it? If not, I would encourage you to meditate on Romans 8, 33 to 39. I would encourage you to ask God to help you to grow in your faith, to be able to rest in Jesus. Something else you might consider. Do you believe that he loves you even when you suffer hardship, loss, hunger, mistreatment? Can you still trust him? Will you trust him knowing that he loves you even in hardship? Meditate on this passage. Invite God to drill this truth deep into your very soul. Will you trust him even if the economy crashes? Will you trust him if a loved one succumbs to COVID-19? Will you trust him if you or a loved one loses everything, and your only hope is eternity with Jesus. Maybe, maybe God's doing a different sort of work in you. Maybe all you could think about is people who are spiritually starving. 
people who are going off into a Christless eternity or they face that prospect and all you can think about is those people. Is God prompting you to do something about those people who don't know Jesus? What step of faith is he asking you to do? Could it be someone in your orcas who needs Christ? A neighbor across the street. We might be tempted to focus on other people around the world and we should do things for them. But who around you needs to know about Jesus? Maybe God's putting them on your mind. What's the step of faith he wants you to take? Maybe your step of faith is completely different. Maybe you're watching this and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. The storm raging inside of you is, is worse than any storm that's raging outside because you're, you're, you're not at ease. You're not at peace. And Jesus said, I come to give you peace. Maybe for you right now, what you need to do is to acknowledge your need for a Savior and put your faith and trust in Jesus. I would invite you right now, right where you are, to acknowledge your need for a Savior. The Bible just tells us that we're all sinners. And we've all fallen far short of God's glory, His, His, perf His standard of perfection. But Jesus died for our sins. He paid all the price for our sins so that we could experience His righteousness. He exchanged our sin for His righteousness so that we could become the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. I would invite you to right now pray with me. If you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, you can use your own words if you want. Or you can pray along with me. God, I know that I need a Savior. The storm that's raging inside of me is about to rip me apart. But I come to you and I ask you to, to forgive me and to draw me close to yourself and give me the peace that Jesus promises. I surrender myself to you and I invite you to do the work in me that only you can do. Maybe your step of faith isn't one that I listed. Whatever God is doing inside of you, take that step of faith. Pivot away from unbelief. Where's the best place to be in that boat with Jesus and the disciples? <laughs> Sitting next to Jesus on the cushion, taking a nap. Pivot away from unbelief and sit down next to Jesus. And you will get through the storm of unbelief with faith in Jesus. Thank you, God, for a Savior who is not weak, who does not run from hard things, but who faces them head on and is able to sleep in the middle of them because he's at peace and he's in control. God, may he calm the storm in our hearts just as he can calm the storms outside. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for the new life he gives us. In his mighty name, we ask you to go with us into this post-COVID-19 future, into the new normal, trusting you to handle whatever storms we may face. In his name, amen. So we provide some questions for you to be able to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to scroll through each of these questions and I'll say them out loud. You can see them on the screen. And then I'll encourage you to pause the video and discuss them and move on to the next one. Here's the first question. How have you had to pivot since March 2020? Go ahead and stop the video and discuss that. Next question. The disciples were working hard to survive the storm while Jesus slept. What did Jesus know that they didn't? Stop the video and discuss that. Here's the third question. How did Jesus use the storm to reveal the disciples' unbelief? And if you want to go a little deeper, how has Jesus used the storm in your life 
to reveal your unbelief. Go ahead and stop the video and discuss those. Fourth question. How has Jesus been using COVID-19 to reveal any deficiencies in your faith? Go ahead and stop that. Discuss it. Final question. What is the step of faith God wants you to make as you go through COVID-19?